Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Michelle and Leah, for this uh, very nice uh, initiative uh, for the young uh, rheologists. So my name is Alice Pelos. I just defended my PhD at the University Paris Cité at the Laboratory Matière and System Complex. And I am now a postdoc at the University of Chicago with the professors Heinrich Heger and Sidney Nagel. So today I'm going to talk, to talk about one of the projects of my PhD, which is about uh, drop spreading of dense granular suspension. And to be more specific, I will talk about the success and breakdown of what we name Panos law. That is the law that we use uh, for regular fluid to describe how a, a, a drop spreads, or more specifically, how the radius grows uh, with time. And uh, we question how uh, this law applies and whether it applies or not when you use a more complex fluid and in my case, it will be a dense granular suspension. So a granular suspension is just a mixture of particles with a fluid, and the particles are large enough so that they don't have any thermal agitation. So a simple criterion is just to make sure that their size is larger than one micron. And this kind of suspensions are ubiquitous in everyday life. Like for instance, blood is a granular suspension of red blood cell into plasma. But you can also think of concrete, which is the mixture of sand and gravel with cement, but also avalanches that are a mixture of ice crystal into the air. And you can understand very well that we want to understand how this complex fluid flow. So yet they are very complex because, the, because there are many objects and you don't want to uh, account for all the motion of the different particles when you uh, study their flow. And this is why we like to use what we name a continuous fluid approach that you can apply when the system size is much larger than let's say 20 particles diameter. And in that case, you can forget about the microscopic details of the suspension and do everything as if you would have a continuous effective fluid. And you will just make sure that you will tune finally the properties so that they still describe the flow of the whole system. And in particular, one uh, feature that you will need to adjust is the viscosity, because of course, when you will put more and more sun in your concrete, for instance, it will be more and more viscous. And what is very nice with granular suspension is that the viscosity of the mixture is very simple. And by very simple, I mean that the viscosity eta of the granular suspension is the viscosity of the suspending fluid, eta naught, times what we name the relative viscosity of the granular suspension, eta s. And when you have hot spheres that are non-Brownian and that do not interact, this effective viscosity, eta s, only depends on phi, where phi is the particle volume fraction, that is the volume of particles divided by the total volume of the suspension. And here, what I am saying to you is that if my suspending fluid is Newtonian, for instance, so if its viscosity, the viscosity does not depend on the shear rate, then the viscosity of all the suspension is also Newtonian because nothing depends on the shear rate. I am also saying that if I have a monomodal granular suspension, for instance, with one particle size d, therefore the viscosity of the suspension does not depend on the particle diameter. So maybe it is intuitive for you. For most people, it is pretty surprising to say that whatever the particle size, the viscosity will be the same, provided that you have the same particle volume fraction. And this is something that is very well confirmed by experiments, but also by numerical simulation. So here on this curve, you can see uh, different suspensions made of different fluid and different particles. And you can see a very nice collapse on the same master curve. And all the relative viscosity for these different suspensions behave the same when you plot them as a function of phi. And in particular, they will diverge at what we name phi c, where phi c is the particle, uh, is the jamming volume fraction that is the maximum amount of solid that you can put in the liquid before you have contacts and therefore the particle cannot move anymore. So you don't have flow anymore when you put more uh, particles than this critical uh, jamming volume fraction. So all this works very well when you have a box suspension, so a large system compared to particle sizes. But of course, as soon as you start to confine the suspension, and so when you have walls, for instance, you will have finite size effects. And you can question how the system will behave, will dissipate, and therefore what will be its effective viscosity. But during my PhD, I was not interested in confinement. I was interested in confinement by a free interface. And here you understand that you have a pretty complex system with two different objects. Mm -hmm. On one hand, you will have the mechanics of a confined suspension. And on the other hand, you will have coupled with that, the dynamics of a free interface that obeys very different flows. So we are not the first one to have studied capillary flows of granular suspension. Some people have studied um, impact of traps, also deep coating. What, that is what is happening when you have an object, you put it in your bath and you pull it out. Then you will have the surface of the object covered with the liquid. 
that is here a suspension. You can also think of the pinch off of a liquid wrap and you will have confinement of the particles in this thin liquid neck. Or also the pinch off of a liquid thread where again you will have confinement of the particles where it pinches off. Yet in literature, there were some uh, canonical example missing. And one of them that I will uh, describe more today is drop spreading of a drop on a solid substrate. And this is a quite complex system because you will have the motion of a contact line that is a very complex object by itself. So this is the subject of a paper that we published last year. But today I'm gonna focus not only on the contact line, but really on the dynamics of the drops as its whole. And in particular, I want to know if Tanner's law, that is the law that describes macroscopic spreading, still applies when I have suspension and when confinement on the particle is increasing. And the way to tune this confinement, for instance, is to change the particle size. So I will go from particle sizes going from 20 microns to 550 microns. I will talk a bit about higher volume fraction, but most of the time I will be at 40%. And you can see here that the dynamics of the particle phase look very different depending on the size of the particles that we are using in the experiment. The question is though, how does the whole dy dynamic of the drop, so how does the dynamic of the contact line depends on this particle size and on the drop volume also, for instance, and many other features. So during the experiment that I will show you, I use two kinds of granular suspension. The suspending fluid can be either a PEC copolymer or a mixture of triton with zinc chloride. And both these fluids are very viscous and Newtonian, which means that the viscosity is very well defined and does not depend on the shear rate that the fluid is seeing. And in this fluid, I will immerse particles that can be either polystyrene in the PEC copolymer or PMMA particles in the Triton mixture. And this system is very nice because you have a nice density matching between polystyrene and PEG and PMMA and Triton, which means that I don't have sedimentation nor creaming of the particles during the experiments. Of course, my particles are non brownian so the particles uh, diameter are larger than 10 micron. And I am in a dense regime, most of the time 40%, which means that the viscosity of the suspension is 10 times that of the is 10 times that of the suspending fluid. So the relative viscosity at 40% is equal to 10. Okay, and both this suspension behave exactly the same in terms of rheology, but they just look very different because as you can see here on this picture, the triton and PMMA is completely transparent, and the peg and polystyrene uh, suspension uh, is opaque, and you can really see the particles. So now it's time to introduce the famous tunnel flow that I've been adv advertising so far. And this flow comes from the balance of the three forces that are at play. So on one hand, you have viscosity that tends to prevent spreading because it doesn't want the liquid to flow. And it will be uh, balanced by gravity and capillarity, which both uh, promote spreading. So gravity just because of the weight of the drop that wants to spread. And capillarity because I am in the situation of perfect or quasi-perfect wetting. So it means that um, the fluid really wants to have a very low contact angle, almost zero, and therefore you will have spreading and the, the contact line will go outwards. So you can write the expression of these forces uh, per unit length. They will write like this. And if you add some assumption, like volume conservation, which is a pretty good assumption, uh, you can uh, come up with how uh, the radius should depend on time. And in fact, you can show that you have two situations large drops or puddles and small drops that will be more like spherical caps. And the criteria is how the system size compares with LC, where LC is the capillary length of the system that compares gravity with capillary effects. So the most fam famous version of Tanner's law is the one of small drops. And it states that the radius should grow as a power law of time with an exponent one over 10. But in my presentation, I will focus more on large drops. So they're more, more like puddles again. They are much larger than the capillary length of the system, and the radius uh, should grow at the pole of time with an exponent one over eight. Yeah, Leah, you raise your hand. Yeah, I just have one question. Whenever yeah. you, um, how did you choose like the size of your drop compared to the uh, those phenomenon? Because if you're like really centered to the drop, you will not have exactly the same phenomenon as if you are really at the contact line. And how did you choose the um, the size of the drop depending on that? Uh, so I will just, uh, I have a, a syringe pump. Yeah. And I will make sure that the volume, the overall volume is much la larger than a C cube, maybe. Okay. And I will be typically at least four times 
uh, greater than the, the equivalent volume of the spherical drops. If I okay. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. So if my uh, uh, spreading is driven by gravity, uh, therefore uh, the radius should grow as a power law of time with an exponent one over eight. And in this factor A, I will have the properties of the fluid that should come into account. And in particular, Tanner's law says that the radius should, should depend on the drop volume. So of course, the larger the volume, the larger the radius. It depends on the density that is well-defined because here my particles and my fluids have the same density. And it also depends on the viscosity of the fluid in the case of a continuous fluid. But as you can see here on this video, uh, so this is a granular drop that spreads, the particles are 80 microns. You can see that the flow is not homogeneous. So in particular, near the edges, you see that there is a region where there are very few or no particles. And the flow uh, in terms of particle motion, when you compare center and the edges of the drop look very different. So the question is, what is the viscosity that we want to use? Because here we are probably not dealing with a box system that it is, going, uh, it is undergoing strong confinement. And the question is, therefore, what is the viscosity that we want to use if we can apply Tanner's law? So just, uh, and also a way to uh, tune this confinement, of course, is to change the particle size. So if I keep the drop volume pretty much constant, I can try to see uh, how uh, the particulate phase will, will evolve. And as you can see here, the dynamics for the largest and the smallest particles are very uh, different. So to uh, measure the radius as a function, of time, the setup is pretty simple. Uh, my drops are made using a syringe pump. This way I control a volume, the volume that I want to deposit on the uh, substrate. The substrate is a silicon wafer, so it is atomically flat, so very smooth substrate. The drops spread on this uh, wafer. I look from the top and I have a lead panel to lighten from above. And to extract the radius, I just use what we name the hoof transform. It's a very efficient way to uh, find circles uh, on the picture and uh, I, this way I can follow the radius of the drop. And in the following, what is important is that when I talk about the radius of the drop, I mean the radius of the liquid and not the radius of the particulate phase. Okay, so now let's see how the radius depends on time when we do the experiment with pure fluid or granular suspension. So on this graph, you can see the radius as a function of time in log-log representation for pure fluid, which are the white symbols and granular suspension made of 40 microns particles. So there are different drop volumes ranging from 10 to 1,000 microliters. And what you can see is that any curve will align with, straight, with the black straight lines. And these lines have a slope 1 over 8 in log-log representation. So it means that we seem to agree very well with this a version of Tanalo that is driven by gravity. And if you compare with the slope 1 over 10, that is the capillary-driven regime, uh, we are clearly, uh, the slope is clearly off. So it seems that Tanner's law is working very well with all pure fluid, but also with all granular suspension, despite, despite the significant addition of particles. And you do see that there is a scattering in the data because, of course, I have different volumes, so I will have different radius. Uh, so to make sure that I know the true volume, I will just wait my drop after each experiment to have the true volume of the, the drop that I deposited using this syringe pump. And also you can see that the experiment can be pretty long. So 10 to the power of five is one day of experiment. So you can guess here that it is a several months of experiment. If I want to vary all the volumes to do several times the experiment, to vary the, drop, the particle diameter. So what I mean here is that the viscosity of my suspending fluid will vary depending on the day of the experiment. And I want to account for this viability due to temperature or humidity effects. So to do so, I will just use a capillary viscometer uh, during the experiment and measure several, several times the viscosity to make sure that I know the viscosity that I uh, the viscosity of the suspending fluid during the experiment. And if I now want to uh, remove uh, volume volume variability and uh, viscosity variability uh, due to uh, experimental uh, constraints, I can do so and build this uh, so quantity R star where I normalize volume and viscosity effects. And what you can see here is that you have a very nice collapse for the different data for pure fluid and for suspension, which means that uh, we do obey uh, Tanner law and the factor, the prediction of the factor is very good. Yet, to be honest, you have still an offset between pure fluid and suspension. So the white dots and the pink dots, they don't collapse on the same mass cycle. And the reason for that is that when I normalized viscous effects, I normalized viscosity variation due to temperature and humidity but I didn't normalize the fact that I added particles. And of course, I increased the viscosity by doing so. 
So if I wanted to have a perfect collapse with the pure fluid data, I would need an additional factor that I need that I name eta t, which is the effective viscosity in tunnel slope. And if I would be in the box situation, this factor should just be eta s, the relative viscosity of the suspension that only depends on phi. But here I am not in the box situation, so I can therefore question what is the value of this factor eta t, which is again the effective relative viscosity in tunnel slope. So first, what you can see on this graph is that this factor does not depend on the drop volume. Because when I normalize drop volume by dividing R by the right uh, volume with the right exponent, you see that all the pink dots, they will align along the same master curve. So eta t does not depend on drop volume. You can question what is its value, and also if it depends on the particle diameter, because the particles will undergo a very uh, different confinement. And interestingly, the answer is that no, eta t does not depend on the particle diameter. So you can see that for particles ranging from 20 to 500 microns, the value of eta t is pretty much always the same. It is around 2.5. And some may argue that it's just normal because viscosity of granular suspension does not depend on particle uh, diameter when you are in the box situation. But yet here, what we are measuring is not the bulk viscosity because the value is much, much lower. Here, the, the effective relative viscosity is 2.5. But if you compare it with the bulk uh, relative viscosity, it is 10. So it is significantly uh, smaller than the bulk viscosity of the granular suspension. So we had several hypotheses to explain this decrease in viscosity. Of course, there will be some wall slip because our substrates are very smooth. Though I haven't ever seen such a decrease in viscosity doing a rheometry, a rheology experiments in a rheometer. So it's, it's a strong effect for only a wall slip. Maybe there is some ordering and layering. I will come back to this later, but it can uh, significantly decrease the effective viscosity. Maybe there is some non-Newtonian non behavior of concentration gradients. So by non-Newtonian behavior, I mean that maybe the extensional viscosity, because here we don't have a purely shear flow, we have also an elongational part. Maybe the suspension does not, does not have a Newtonian extensional viscosity. But if you look at simulations for this uh, such low volume fraction, so 40%, you see that two Trouton's ratio, which compares how extensional viscosity uh, compares with shear viscosity, should be uh, pretty much constant for this range of volume fraction, which means that the, sh the suspension should behave like a regular fluid, because it, uh, for a regular fluid, we would have the same Trouton's ratio. So it shouldn't be a priori an explanation for this decrease in viscosity. So ordering and layering are very good uh, candidates for this decrease in viscosity, because when you look at the viscosity of confined granular suspension, you can have a significant decrease compared to the bulk value of the, the suspension. So you can see here in particular that when the system size else is a multiple integer of the particle diameter, you will have local uh, viscosity minima that are very low. It's uh, valued by five compared to the bulk value. You will have local maxima when you are not a multiple integer. But even if we look at milder confinement, so let's say if the system size is 10 particle diameter, you see on this graph on the left that the value, the effective uh, viscosity is uh, divided by two, by two compared to the value of the bulk situation that is above 20 particles diameter. So it was an amazing candidate to explain what, why we saw such a decrease. And to test this hypothesis, we just tried to kill any possibility for ordering and layering. And the a great way to do so is just to use a polydispersed suspension. So if you have several sizes of, of particles, there is no way you will have a clean ordering and layering like the one we uh, see here sketched on these pictures. And we uh, tried this, the experiment with four uh, different sizes of particles, each representing 10% of the total volume. And though we still saw this a significant decrease when you compare polydispersed screen or suspension, uh, anyway, when you compare it with pure fluid. And uh, the, expect the expectation um, compared to uh, the bulk value of the corresponding suspension. So it means that even if there might be some ordering and layering, it is not enough to explain for the decrease in viscosity that we are measuring uh, with this effective time of viscosity. So the two last candidates were concentration gradients and wall slip. And to visualize uh, such uh, phenomena, we use the Triton and PMMA suspensions. And the trick here is that even if now I cannot see the particles, if I put a fluorescent dye in the liquid, and if I lighten it with a laser sheet, then the fluid will appear as bright, while the particles will remain dark, and the laser sheet will go through because the suspension overall is transparent. And this is a very nice way to visualize particulate flow. So here to be uh, 
to make sure everything clear, I am not anymore in a drop configuration because there are too much curved interface. So here I only have a rivulet configuration with a spreading along one direction to be able to see uh, orthogonal, orthogonally uh, the laser sheet. So the dynamics will be different, but the ingredients should be the same. And if I visualize the spreading of this rivulet of 60 microns particles, you can see very nicely the particulate phase, but it is hard to say that you see any strong gradients in terms of concentration. So the concentration near the tip of the drop is the same as the center, which means that uh, this hypothesis shouldn't be the one explaining why we have such a low viscosity when you measure um, this effective viscosity in tunnel slope. Though what we learned from this suspension is that next to the, the tip of the drop, you have a pretty strong flow of the particulate phase, so a lot of rearrangements, meaning that in this region, you have a lot of wall slip, and wall slip is known, of course, to decrease the viscosity. And so it is uh, for sure uh, one of the reasons that explain why we have this decrease uh, when we measure the macroscopic spreading and the macroscopic dissipation in the system. So with this uh, nice uh, particulate flow movies, we could do the PIV and confirm that for maybe one or two millimeters, we have a strong wall slip next to the wall. So it, it, again, it helps to explain why we have this decrease in the effective viscosity. And also what we did is that we superimposed several pictures among, along a, a quite long amount of time to see how the particulate phase has rearranged uh, during this uh, period. So when you look at the, the edge of the drop, you have a lot, you have a particulate flow, so it is very blurry. If you look at the center of the drop, though, uh, the, the, you have some nice dark spots, meaning that the particles haven't moved during this amount of time. And it means therefore that in this region, you don't really have the flow of a suspension. It is more like you have the, the flow through a granular bed. And so it is known uh, in literature that uh, the effective viscosity through a granular bed is much lower than the corresponding viscosity if this would be considered as a suspension that flows. And also what is very nice is that the effective viscosity through a granular bed uh, does not depend on the particle size. And so it can maybe explain why we don't have this size dependency of the uh, effective viscosity in tunnel flow if you uh, use uh, this effective viscosity of a granular bed. But yet, I think that the main uh, message of this first part is that you can still use a uh, tunnel flow with granular suspension despite the high uh, complexity. And you just need to make sure that the viscosity that you use is not the viscosity of the bulk suspension, but this is an effective viscosity that is much lower than the bulk uh, value. Uh, and this is partially due maybe to a wall slip and also maybe more uh, a different kind of flow that is more flow through a granular bed than uh, the flow of a suspension really. So before moving to the second part, do I have questions on this? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I do have one question. Like, um, depending on where you are on your drop, you can have a, so the, the, the whole flux is gonna be completely different. And uh, here you're looking really at the tip of the drop but what happened like really at the center of the drop? Is it really the center of the drop when you're at uh, X equal zero? Yeah. Yes, I am. Okay. And here you don't have an effect uh, on the other direction or? So you should assume that it should, I mean, the, so the radial component should go to zero because it should, if I would have the full drop, it would be red because I would have negative values. Yeah. So it, okay. I think I just would have just, and uh, overall, I, I have a downward uh, vertical uh, component of the velocity. Like this. Yeah, because uh, okay. so the flow is like this. So it's extensional flow in this way. OK. And did you focus on that so at some point or never? No, on... it's, I didn't have enough you know, resolution to have really, uh, the whole flow with uh, good resolution. Okay. So I, I yeah, didn't yeah, but... want to have uh, an XPIV analysis. OK, yeah. thank you. I also have a question on the particles properties. Uh, I mean, I do you think there are contacts between particles here? Yes, I know they're frictional, but though I'm at the beginning of thickening, but I mean, 40% is, is dense, but it's not that dense. I mean, it shouldn't be yeah. And also, I mean, here, everything, the flow is because of gravity practically, right? Yeah. So, I, I mean, is it, do you think the shear is high enough to, I mean, the stresses are high enough to, to make the particles 
uh, come into contact or or not? Because so the other question was, what what if you change the particles? What if you use other particles that are, I don't know that are more so, rough? <laughs> so I haven't tried with rougher particles. I guess that what would change mainly is the rearrangement in confined region because this is clearly where the stress will be the higher because there in this region you will have the stress due to gravity but also the stress from the free interface that will become more and more important because the interface here is undergoing so the stress will concentrate there from the capillary uh, contributions. Uh, I was more interested in going to smoother particles actually. So Lilith who will talk in four weeks gave me some. Uh, I did experiment, but I haven't analyzed the data yet. So no, yeah, it makes sense it because more more rare than just yes. and and actually before you said that there was no migration migration that was also one of the questions I had. But can you show again the movie where you have this nice lateral view of the drop? Because that's that's beautiful. So did you did you try to measure the local volume fraction here? I mean, you have, I I think you can from from yeah, PIB. I could. It, I it does it does it doesn't look like there is any gradient of of volume fraction, honestly. Yeah, I don't believe. I, I felt that particle migration could play a role, maybe at lower volume fraction, but there yeah. I think. Yeah, I mean, students. Because that could that could also exp I mean there, there should be a relation between particle migration and contact. So if you go smoother, you should I mean, if the mm -hmm. particles are rough and you see no migration, maybe there's also a sign mm -hmm. that there is no contact between the, I don't I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. But this I agree with you that there is no visible migration here and also ordering everything looks very, very nicely mixed. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And that's uh, Yeah, you have a question. Oh, Jovina, maybe. Uh, hi. So, um, I'm uh, since you like um kind of figured that slip might be a very a major reason behind uh what's happening. I was wondering if we could make the surface rough and then see what happens. Yeah, but only uh studying uh wetting on rough substrates. It's kind of tricky because therefore the contact line would be pinned on the roughness of the substrate and you wouldn't have anymore this very nice uh, spherical shape, uh, circular shape of the drop. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, so now I can, I will maybe move to the second part and if you have questions, keep them for later. But I just wanted to conclude saying that yes, Thanos flow works, but not always. And by not always, I mean, not for an infinite amount of time. And of course, it comes from the fact that at some point, the particles will be too much confined. And this will have a very strong signature when you look at the radius as a function of time curves, where initially you have these very nice straight lines. And at some points, it starts to bend. So the spreading slows down. And if you look from the top, you can clearly see very different dynamics at some point. For the largest particles, at the, the particles, they will reach a critical radius. They will be pinned and they won't move anymore. While when you look at what is happening with the smallest particles, even if you do see a region without particles, uh, you will still see that the particles keep moving with the contact line and advancing, even if they can access to this uh, very uh, thin uh, edge anymore. So the pinning has been confirmed with side views. So here on the left, you can see the radius as a function of time, and you see that you have departing from Thanos behavior between uh, dots two and three which corresponds to these two uh, pictures, two and three on the right. And you can see here that the first line of particles don't, do not move anymore. And from this uh, time, you just have drainage out of the porous uh, and you have this meniscus that goes from a concave to a convex shape, but the particles do not move anymore and they are pinned by the free interface where the precisions become very important. So I measured the evolution of this uh, now particle radius really. So what is the yellow arrow uh, on the picture in the inset. So I see that it, is, it will slow down for the largest particles, but not for the smallest one. And when I go to a higher volume fraction, I am pretty much immediately pinned, and I don't even have this, this kind of behavior at early times. And to try to understand when the spinning happens at 40%, let's say, a very basic idea is just to say when my uh, drop thickness is typically 
one particle diameter, then particles are pinned by the free interface. Capillary forces uh, will uh, keep them together and they won't move anymore. So I need to have a way to have this local thickness. Only most of my experiments were only top views. So the question is, can I have the shape profile from only top views? And the answer is yes. So you can see here that I made a few um, experiments with both top and side views, and I can extract therefore the, the experimental drop profile from the side. And just from knowing the radius from the top view, so this is RT, I can have from um, theoretical uh, expression a very nice way to uh, have the profile of the drop. So just knowing uh, the radius, I can have an idea of what is the local thickness at the center of the drop. So here, for instance, the prediction is the blue dashed line from the radius me measurement, and the dots are the experimental central thicknesses. And by doing so, I can therefore now compare the thickness of the drop with the particle diameter for the different drop volumes and different particle diameters. And you can see here that if I look at, let's say, uh, the 20 microns particles, uh, the, I am far from reaching this uh, critical thickness that is uh, here. This, this is this uh, red line that is uh, very, very far. Uh, so I would have to wait a long, long time. But if I look at the largest particles, so let's say the five and 200 uh, microns particles, I am clearly reaching this limit where the thickness at the center of the drop is typically a particle diameter. And I can define a critical time TC that will tell me when I reach uh, this critical thickness. And I find if I normalize T by TC and R by RC, where RC is the corresponding radius at time is equal to TC, I see that the deviation only ha uh, happens when uh, these quantities are equal to one. And I have this bending of the curves only for the blue uh, data points. So to finish uh, this presentation, all these results were mostly at 40%. I tried to go a bit higher and I didn't in, uh, investigate too much this uh, range of concentration because the dynamics are very uh, different. So you can see here that even if the drop volumes here are all the same, uh, the spreading uh, are very different. And in particular, you have this uh, jamming of the particulate phase, phase very early at 43 and 47%. And the dynamic of drainage uh, of the liquid is much slower. So this is something I think that uh, is worth uh, investigating in the future. Uh, how does a contact line drains out of a purse with a purse that is formed upon uh, confinement, uh, upon spreading. But what I just want to uh, mention here is that I have a jamming of a system that shouldn't jam because we are far from the jamming in the box situation, but yet at 43% very early, uh, clearly we have no more particulate flow. So as a conclusion, panel flow with screen suspension still works and follows this nice R is equal to a T with a power one over eight. But you need to make sure that you don't use the bulk viscosity if you want really to have a very quantitative description of the spreading, you need to use an effective viscosity, which is smaller than the bulk viscosity due to wall slip, I think mainly. And then at some point when the particle size is com comparable with that of the thickness of the drop, you reach a new regime where tennis law is not working anymore and you have a very different uh, behavior with the drainage out of the purse. And there are many other things that uh, we should investigate and that uh, maybe all will come soon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Alice. That um, was very clear and, and a beautiful work. So thank you again. And questions? Uh, there are some questions. No? I, 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 do do have, have... I do have one question again. You talked a bit about the instability, Rayleigh plateau instability, but you didn't really, really go through that. What did you do exactly on that? To what extent? Like, what was your work on that? The Ray Taylor? Yeah. Um, Ray Taylor, sorry. Yeah. So, so to make things clear, uh, I just, uh, Ray Taylor instability is when uh, you have instability between and coefficient between gravity and capillarity. So, what I did uh, during my PhD is that I uh, let a uh, granular layer of suspension spraying, and then I returned uh, this plate and see how the surface becomes unstable. Okay. So, here again, what I, I tune is the confinement of the particles. And here, I, the dynamics of the interface is that, so for, for a drop, I mean, the interface wants to become flat in the way that I, I am in a situation of quasi-perfect wetting. With the Rayleigh Taylor, it's the opposite. The, the interface used to be flat and now wants to distort because of gravity. But the question is, can I distort it if I have particles beneath? And so this is all what I did, tuning confinement to see how 
the dynamics of the interface the interface uh, is affected by the addition of particles. Okay, so you have been able to see some waves on top of uh, drops. And yes. so th the size of the amplitude of that, is it correlated to the size of the particle or something like that? No, so uh, what is very nice is that the wavelength of the instability is the same one than the, that of the pure fluid. Oh, okay. So particles mm -hmm. only affect the dynamics of uh, yeah. the instability. At some point it can kill it if the particle yeah. is very large compared to the thickness of the layer. But the wavelength yeah. itself is exactly the same, same one than that of the pure fluid. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, Antoine. Hey, Antoine. Yeah, hi, Alice. Uh, thank you for your, your talk. I just have two quick questions. Uh, from the last video you showed us about the volume fraction. Yes, uh, these ones. Can you uh, maybe, I don't know, can you map if there is uh, one layer of particle or maybe two or three, because it seems on the 40% that maybe you just have a uniform one layer of particles and not in the two other cases. Yeah, so I have the picture somewhere, but I, I okay. won't go through all my photos. But yeah, true. Here, you have mainly one. At the center, yeah. you have two, in fact. It's uh, not very clear to see, but yeah, it's one or two. And here, it's really like you, you just deposit a pile of particles, a few rearrangements, and then it doesn't move anymore. So it's more like a, yeah, a granular, a wet system of particles. And fluid does not, can't drag the particles anymore. Okay. Uh, can you uh, also go back to the rivulet uh, configuration because I, I I think I missed something about it. Uh, so you are imaging. Uh, so the 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 rivulet is advancing towards us, right? No, it, it follows this blue uh, arrows, so it goes to the left. Okay. And the right. So you so it, so it doesn't move towards us. No. So and it this is, the... yeah, because the issue with this kind of visualization is that you need a flat interface for the laser to come through. So yeah, sure. plate. And you also want to see through uh, a flat interface, otherwise you would need to reconstruct the, this with optical distortion, it would be a hell. So the idea is that we have these uh, two uh, perpendicular walls, the bottom and the side one. I image through the side wall and I lighten from the bottom one, and this way I can see uh, this river spreading. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but, but, yeah. Oh, we have something in the chat. Oh, kindness is saying thank you, Liz. Nice talk. And I do have a couple more questions. I'm sorry, I'm asking you to go back again to to the different volume fractions at the end. Because you said that so all your um, suspensions are uh, monodisperse. Yeah. So like, but here like we could we can see some small particles. So that's. Is that due just to, to how far they are from the, the observer, or? No, if you look closer, it's only air bubbles. So uh, these are Oh, not... so that's air bubbles. OK, they're, they're, that's, that was the other question. OK. Yeah, it's not very clean experiments. But well, well, I mean, they don't seem to do much to the particles, because when uh, you can see that the air bubble will uh, go away and the particles don't move. But yeah, yeah, it's the issue with dense suspension that if you want to make them very homogeneous, uh, you need to mix them before and you will have air bubbles. Sure. So. And, and, but that's funny because actually you can, you can see that somewhat those, those air bubbles are first spreading and then coming back somehow. Yeah, so I guess it's only... Uh, They're also exploding, but yeah, some of um, them like seem to be... Yeah. So I think there are different way things. So first, the menis the meniscus is going convex, so the air bubble maybe uh, will go uh, toward the particle because of this convexity and buoyancy. So they will tend to to rise and therefore to go closer to the. Because that the, the other question, I mean, so that made me think that there might be some some weird flow going going on. So the other idea could be maybe to to use very tiny. Uh, tiny, tiny tracers to try to trace also the flow and not only the particles. Yeah, it's something that we've been thinking. About. I mean, it's it, it would be hard. I don't know how to, to I mean, experimentally, it would be a mess, probably. Yeah, so definitely if it would be at lower volume fraction, it would be nice. Yeah. At this volume fraction, I don't know what we would see, what we would be able to see at least. But, yeah. And back to the tribology, the, the other interesting thing would be to Again, I don't think there is many, but if there is some adhesion between the particles and not only friction. 
So again, what is the so what is the question? Do you think there is any adhesion between the particles? That's the real. Oh question. no no, um, I'm pretty sure there is none. Okay. Okay, yeah, they are very nice plastic polystyrene okay. particles. They don't ag aggregate or anything, and they're very, very stable. Some people argue that they might dissolve in the peg, but I mean, we check that thoroughly, mm. and the particle size is very constant. So yeah. No. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? So people in the chat are thanking you, Alice. I don't know if you see the chat. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Okay, so if that's all, let me stop recording.